The GA Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. Well, when I started running, I suppose I didn't stop, and when I got the chance to go, I said I should go, and so I opened up. We were only the small little fish out there, so we are, and uh, we're trying hard to make it through. But it's hard to get the breaks when you're the smaller fish. Because I love this county so much, you know, and it's just, I'm delighted that the lads, the lads did it for the people of Walford today, because, like, I, I'm, har- I'm heartbroken. <laughs> We can come on the show today, Keen, and we can talk about a great game at the weekend. So this is two weekends in a row. We had Mayo, a brilliant performance, a brilliant footballing performance, and now we have Kerry Dublin, who went toe-to-toe on Saturday night. So isn't it great that we can come on the show? Conan's not here um, today. It's just me and Keen, And, you know, 41 scores in a packed house in Tralee with a brilliant atmosphere. And I'm not going to lie, you just go to bed happy after watching a game like that. Yeah, we just had to exclude Conan for today because he was going to give out <laughs> about bad defending and stuff like that and that there wasn't enough sweepers back. Oh no, well I might give out about some bad defending. Like it's not oh, well, all I'm good I'm news. definitely going to give out about bad defending <laughs> myself. So. But it was a brilliant game and when Gaelic football is played like that it's just fantastic. It's a great sport. Um, I thought the interview with Darren Moynihan, did you see this after the game? Like He was full of youthful enthusiasm but clearly trying to watch that he didn't say anything yeah, stupid. He did, yeah. But he, he made a great comment that I really liked and it's pure Kerry. He says, yeah, Dublin won't mind well it's nice to just let them know that we're still here yeah yeah it was good you it know was good I mean? yeah no he came across very well actually he, he had, did you could just tell he was absolutely buzzing after the game like he was absolutely delighted with the win because uh, nearly everything he was going to say he had a bit of a grin coming but he was just trying to play it all down you know we've we've yeah. we've, we've been in those positions before where you're just absolutely buzzing after the game delighted with the win but you know it's not the All-Ireland final so you're trying to play it down a bit and like they have to play it down at the end of the day because like let's be honest uh, Kerry have beaten Dublin in bigger games than this they beat them in the league final in Croke Park and withstood a Dublin onslaught at the end and won it um, fair and square in a footballing game a brilliant league final and that was a, a league final that Dublin really obviously wanted to win like Jim Gavin said after the game that Kerry are well ahead of us in fitness levels and he's probably right and uh, Kerry were mad for it and Dublin, I think they deserve an awful lot of credit even to have stayed in that game. Do you know what I mean? But, like, I mean, context, I, we were saying last week Mayo are back. And we can say Mayo are back because based on James Horn's record with them before and now we see Mayo back to, you know what I mean, to where they were. But to say Kerry are back based on this one league, it's encouraging for them. There's yeah, no it's, doubt. It, look, it's very, very positive for them and their manager and for their supporters to get behind something. And to beat Dublin, the All-Ireland champions, You'll always take something from it, but yeah, you have to you have to take the overall picture into it and say, I still wouldn't be uh, expecting Kerry to win the All Ireland this year. Far from it, um, but they have shown that they have an ability to. They've shown that they have players of ability able to compete. Now, whether they're able to compete in the white heat of championship against a a, a Dublin team going at full tilt or a Mayo team going at full tilt, that remains to be seen. However. They did compete very well the other night and they probably should have won by more. Yeah, no, really. they def- oh, they definitely should have won by yeah. more and that's why the Dublin deserve an awful lot of credit for not being fully fit but still sticking in that bloody game to make Kerry shit it at the end. Like, I mean, it's just that they are brilliant champions, there's no doubt. I don't want to spend uh, much time talking about the row at the end because there was nothing really in it that the cameras picked up. I didn't see any, it's the usual old wrestling and it was stupid and it didn't look good at the end of a great game. And I'd love to know who started it because if it was Kerry that started that, it's the most stupid thing I've ever come across because why give Dublin more motivation? Why, after that game, Kerry should have been just shaking hands saying, you're great champions, we lucky to hold on in the end. You don't need to give this Dublin team more. Nerves will kick in with Dublin this year. There's no doubt. It's never been done before. You don't need Dublin to be able to get that extra edge. Now, like the extra edge, I don't think should make much difference for championship. But when you're going for five in a row and you've won four and you need maybe that extra little bit of a motivation, like these these lads laughed in our faces. Now, we don't know exactly what yeah. happened, but something sparked that at the end. Oh, it, de- it definitely does have an impact. You can't, it can't be denied that if if there's a particular player, I mean, there, I'm sure there's all players we've come against uh, in our careers that the sight of them gives you energy. Because Me. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you you did that to a lot of people, I'm sure. Um, I I always liked you, Oli. Yeah, I know, but well, I'm not talking about you. We but yeah, but be it is in contact. No, absolutely. But <laughs> but it is it is one of those things that you think. Look, you you've got your win, um, you've enjoyed it. And again, we don't know. I I don't know what started the bloody thing. But if, if it was from the Kerry side, it was a bit silly. If it was from the Dublin side, 
it's a bit narky, you yeah. know. Let's be honest about it. But um, there wasn't a huge amount in it, and always in these situations, it's just all the bodies kind of piling in, and it, in f- most of the time, there's there's nothing too dangerous going on. It's it's lads going in trying to pull somebody away, or or push a lad off, or there's very little going on. And I think the the video clip that Mike Quirk put up uh, was absolutely hilarious of Jim That's Gavin right. walking past it. So anyone who hasn't seen it really yeah. should take a look at it. It's absolutely brilliant. Look up Mike Quirk's Twitter account. He compared it to just avoiding a pothole. So Jim Gavin is just all this mayhem is going on, and Jim Gavin is just calmly walking past it, and then just veers out of camera. And then appears back in camera on the other side. Yeah, of the it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> like he's just, he's just so cool. Like he just doesn't give a shite what's going no. on there. He's just like lads, we lost. And I'd say he's just thinking what he's going to say in the dressing room afterwards. He's not bothered with the lads falling around yeah, themselves. Yeah, I'd say him. he could even be walking past the going. This will do us no harm, anyways. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, I just, I don't even want to spend much time on this because we've too much to talk about. But Jason Sherlock, she's, there was loads of rumors. I don't work usually on a Friday. But it was in to do Tom Ryan interview. So um, it was a random time that we put up the Tom Ryan uh, director general interview. So if anyone hasn't listened to that, just check out SoundCloud. We'll have it up on YouTube um, soon enough. But this Jason Sherlock rumors like this was crazy stuff. I think it was first reported in the mirror. Um, First, it was that Jason Sherlock is leaving the Dublin panel or there's doubts about his future. And then surprisingly enough for the Irish Independent, Martin Brettany and Colin Keyes had a joint piece saying that he was gone, confirmed gone. Because I was l- trying to look back along the timeline of it because I, was b- I wasn't watching the news of the day that day. I was prepping for that interview. And um, like, I mean, it was just a, a weird one. Then suddenly Connolly, <laughs> Connolly's back and what the hell? Then you get to the match and Jason Sherlock's getting off the bus with everybody else. Like, yeah, it's breaking news. Jason Sherlock gets off the team bus. <laughs> 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 it's just, I, where did he, I don't know where these things come from. They're just bizarre sometimes how things can spiral out of control or these rumours grow legs but uh, yeah definitely I'm sure I'm sure Dublin are delighted to still have him anyway because he does appear to have made a, quite an influence in, on their attacking play over the last number of years yeah no I definitely have so we saw the good and bad of Niall Morgan um, yesterday so he kicks an equalising point off the outside of the boot almost a carbon copy of it a bit further out than the one he scored against uh, Mayo which was like uh, didn't mean anything in that game because they're being well beaten so that's fine. We know Niall Morgan has that in his locker now. Um, but I thought what he did for the last free to be thrown up was just completely out of order. And while you could say Ulton Harney was a bit naive and silly, I still don't think that he was because um, you have a foul on the Roscommon corner forward, a blatant foul. He's on the ground. Niall Morgan comes over beside him and puts his two knees down on him. Now, there wasn't excessive force on it, but he he actually put his knees down onto him. Ulton Harney saw this and any good teammate will back up his team teammate and he pushed Niall Morgan away. Now, this wasn't a strike. It was, it was a push. So it's all right to say, here, get off my mate. You see it all the time. What does Niall Morgan do? He holds his face and throws himself back and gets the ball thrown up. Lose, like, like I mean... For me, that's completely out of order. Now, I'm, I, I don't even want to criticise Ulton Harney because he actually, you can say he was stupid, but he never expected that, that kind of theatrics out of Niall Morgan. He's pushing him away from his mate. Like, he's pushing him for having come down his knees. I'd give 10% Ulton Harney was silly and 90% of the blame to Niall Morgan. Yeah, it's, I, it's difficult to know what to say on a thing like that because it's just... It's very hard to look at something like that and not dislike Niall Morgan, really. You yeah. know, and that he he'd scored a magnificent point. He'd shown his skill level. Like we know the talent that he has, but then to do something like that, it's just what's it all about? I mean, like that's that's that sort of horrendous win at all cost mentality. It is, you know. And I would imagine then his teammates would have congratulated him in the dressing room. And you know, it that, that is yeah, the win like, at all cost mentality. Like th- that is the thing. Like Tyrone have lost their first two games, and they're they're away from home. They get a last minute equaliser, and then it's like, oh no, we're going to lose again. And sometimes, did did he did he do it with any sort of Machiavellian intent? Like, did was what is was it his intention to get the ball thrown up? Or did he just lose the plot and stick the knees into the man on the ground? And the answer is only he knows. If it's, you know, there, there are certain players and they're very clever and they will do something like that, with, like you're saying, with a minimal force, with nothing, but they're just doing it to try and annoy the other player. Like yeah. they maybe will go down and they'll rub a lad's head and all of a sudden he'll react and get the ball thrown up. It yeah. happens all over the field. Yeah. Alton Harney, if that's the case, he fell into his it, trap. Yeah, if that's the case, he fell into the trap. Whereas, you know, sometimes there can be a nasty 
a nasty thing about it and you know that that can't be condoned look the diving can't be bloody condoned either I mean it's a different scenario if if Morgan goes over and uh, does something different and and the ball gets thrown up and you're saying oh well maybe he was a bit clever there he just wound the Ross Common man up but that's not what he really did there yeah. like he, he stuck the knees isn't, in isn't and he got a shove in the chest and jumped on the ground like that's pathetic behaviour really isn't the throw up really a weird one in GEA like I mean should it not be set, treated as two separate incidents that that free is awarded now you push Niall Morgan that should be a separate issue to the free being awarded. You know what I mean? It really, it, it, it this has happened. It happens all the time in GA, but it really highlighted. This was the last kick of the game. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's a it's a weird one in GA that he's just all right. We'll throw it up there now. Here, hang on. That was a free. If you've got a problem with what Ulton Harney did, give him a yellow card for doing that. Yeah, don't yeah, don't take the game away from us. Uh, yeah, look, it, it, it is an interesting one and maybe it needs to be looked at. Yeah, OK. But, well, we're not going to get too much We're not into getting into rule changes. Well, I have a headline that you're going to like. The Royals go top, right? So they're back in division. I've given up on Armagh. We're back. I'm not into... Maybe they're back, Woody. I've been a bit of a cheerleader for Armagh um, for the last few weeks and I'm giving up on it. You've been brainwashed by Stevie. They though. flatter to deceive. They've gone... They went a point behind on 60 minutes with a gale force win and you think for all kind of the world that they're going to push on and win that. Like, you were at this game. Like, I mean, how on earth did it conspire to to leave Mead win that game? Oh, yeah, six like, points? They, they absolutely had Mead on the rack when they got back to a point behind like Mead it looked it was only a matter of how much Armagh were going to win by at that stage with, with the way the game had gone because Mead simply could not get out of their own half they couldn't win their own kickouts Armagh were cleaning them on breaking ball they were working forward winning their frees taking their scores with the wind and you know Mead, Mead started the second half very badly they were they were well clear at half time having done some great work in the first half and and utilised the wind to, to get some scores from distance but you know they conceded something like four points in the opening four or five minutes at the second half and you're thinking oh god like it's a long long way left in this second half Um, but Armagh would be disgusted with themselves that they didn't kick on now, there was a couple of a uh, couple of substitutions made which you know Stephen Campbell was taken off and uh, Ryan McShane I think was taken off as well and they were surprising changes because they were causing Mead problems now I don't know whether it was injuries or they just wanted to get fresh legs in yeah. at that stage of the game but they were certainly having an impact on the game and the subs that came in maybe just couldn't get to the pitch of it quick enough and, and didn't really impact the game Yeah. Do you need subs to come in to hit the pitch because they take a little bit of time yeah, when you're, like, like you're a point behind Yeah well so, do you know what it's a skill in its own right some guys are able to come off the bench and immediately make an impact yeah. and they're straight into it other guys it takes them time to feel their way into the game and look that's that's neither here nor there I suppose that's something that players need to learn if they're coming in and maybe managers learn stuff about their players then in those scenarios but Mead will take huge um, uh, huge encouragement from the way they finished out the game because like it was an extremely strong breeze going straight down the field they were after they were on the rack they were really on the rack and in fairness to them they, they held the ball quite well in their own full back line now Armagh probably at that stage of the game needed to probably press up on them and push now they had been doing that for large periods of the game and both teams were trying to press high up the field and it was taking a huge amount of energy out of both teams so I'd say Armagh just maybe ran out of steam near right. the end Mead were able to then work the ball up the field win a couple of frees and, and get a couple of scores and just get themselves over the line So they both went for it Mead and Armagh with the win right so this is no, A like big team like Mead really pressed up on them now the, the one thing was which was a bit of a strange one for me was on the Armagh kickouts they were allowing Armagh to take the kickouts kind of short they didn't really press up man to man they went zonal with their six forwards they kept the six forwards up when zonal Donald Kyogen who was playing in the half back line a lot of the time was kind of spare in behind the mid midfield so Armagh were playing it short but then it was it was massive pressure on right. from all six mid forwards trying to kind of swarm tackle they were leaving their own men and, and two two and three men trying to press the ball yeah. and they got they got great reward from that they got a couple of scores from turnovers and winning the ball back um, so and Armagh did much the same a slight difference with Armagh was that they manned up man to man in, right. in the when Mead had the ball in their defence and it was maybe only one player pressing the ball and then if he got corralled down a certain road then other players came in so um, huge huge work rate from both teams and what I would say is I you would take encouragement as a supporter of both of those sides if they continue to play with that sort of positive mentality they, they'll both be quite good to watch because they do engage the opposition they're not happy to just 
back off too much now look, yeah. you can't do that for the whole 70 well, minutes there, there are times in the game where they where they do have to drop off because they're just they don't have it in the legs but where where they can both teams are trying to be positive the wind obviously forced their hand and that's why it's interesting that you mentioned that because the Galway tactics with the wind were mind boggling right so they had most of their men back inside their own 45 with the wind so they were they were dropping off trying to invite Monaghan on they had the wind now I can't fair enough if you have a system but if you have a strong wind surely you have to have flexibility within that system to say we need to play a little bit more attacking because here's the thing so they're dropping off inside the 45 Monaghan are playing on the outside of them so they always have out balls so you're only running down your own clock with the wind like Monaghan are playing around outside them Ma- Galway happy enough to let them have it outside the 45 because they're only in zones inside and I'm thinking how does this make sense you have a gale force wind and you're allowing Monaghan uh, wind down the clock so it's interesting with the Armagh Mead tactics because I saw with Carlo and Longford they were level five points apiece with Carlo having played with a gale force wind I think okay that's your system but surely you have to have the flexibility to say if there's a gale force wind lads you have to push out now and let's try and win that ball back and make the most of this wind oh I, I would totally agree with that I mean I, I Right, I can I can understand the argument that people will make and say, look, the right thing to do is the right thing to do, t- no matter what the conditions are. But the conditions have a massive impact on what yeah. you can do. I mean, in terms of with with a very strong wind at your back, the scoring zone is much much bigger. In Navin yesterday, the scoring zone was pretty much anywhere inside fifty fifty five meters, pretty much the full width of the pitch. You know, it, uh, when you had the wind, when you didn't have the wind, the scoring zone was pretty much. Any you know your standard scoring zone yeah. inside 30, Tiny. 35 metres and within the width of the goals almost because if it was any wider than that the ball was going to tail off so obviously you have much you have a much smaller zone to defend when you're playing um, with the, you know sort of um, with the wind so you, you have to press up on the opposition because you'll have loads of time to get back to get bodies back you press high up the field try and get the turnover and if you know if the, if they break out down one wing, you know you have lots of guys that can get back and cut block up that space from yeah. the opposite side and drift across like that. I, I just can't understand why you would stand off a team when you have a wind. Unbelievable! Have to and like I mean, you've never played in the defence, right? I can just tell you when you're playing against a big wind like that, the thoughts of getting it out past your own forty-five. Like you're under serious, serious pressure. If if you're being marked man for man, there's no one available. Someone's tackling you. Yeah, no energy to do you have anything. No energy. The wind in your face. To think that you can just stroll out when you're playing against the wind and meet the other team at the forty-five and go, right, well, we'll pass it around here. We're not. We're against the wind. This can take us all day. If if it, it's it's just mind-bogglingly, boggingly stupid. Yeah. Well, like that. That to me was the difference at the end of the Mead game where Armagh actually looked like they just didn't have the energy to continue to press Mead in right. that zone. So Mead, Mead in that situation held one player back almost in the full back line and every time they'd kind of break forward, nothing would happen. They'd recycle the ball back and they'd edge their way up the field. Like there were times when Mead, there was a, a guy on, in possession and he had no option because Armagh were man on man. Yeah. The, the Mead players were absolutely out on their feet from trying to break out against the wind. Nobody was shown for the ball, so the ball carrier was under serious, serious you're, pressure. You're in big trouble. Yeah, big, big trouble. And Armagh got huge reward from it, as Mead did in the first half. Um, and it is early in the season, and both of these teams are trying to get to the level of playing, being able to play to that level of intensity for a full 70 minutes at a really high level. Like, you see the likes of Dublin and Mayo and these teams. They're able to do that because they have that that fitness built up of years and years and loads of massive games at that level of intensity Armagh coming up from Division 3 made from Division 2 with a lot, you know both teams with a lot of young players or new players that haven't had games at that level of intensity yeah. so they're, they're definitely two teams that are building There was one point Monaghan got in the second half it was a long uh, kick out from Began it was punched on by Jack McCarron in midfield Dermot Malone won the punch on Laid it off to I think it was Desi Ward running past who hand passed it on to to Conor McManus who stuck it over the bar. The whole thing took eleven seconds. Now Monaghan were given Galway played very well against the wind. Funnily enough, because that system made a lot of sense against the wind because Monaghan had to try and force it. They were under pressure, and then your your counter attack works so much better when the other team are trying to force it through you. Monaghan were in no hurry to engage them in the first half, so it was a you know, and like I mean I was thinking with with Began why is he not driving every single kick out long? 
Honestly, because you, you have a 50-50 chance of winning it. Now, I know Tomás Flynn is a good fetcher, but get in, get in around him. You're winning the ball in their 45. You're immediately in no, under no pressure from a defensive point of view. You've got it down to your 50-50 chance. If you're um, going short and you're trying to work it through Galway, do you really have a 50-50 chance of getting a score? Do you only got, what, 11 in 70 minutes? How many attacks did they have? I think your percentages of just getting it down there. Would it, and again, you wonder, do these teams discuss gale force wins or what your... I would have had begging saying, never go short with that wind. You've got a kick that can reach their 45-metre line. Let's see what... And got the gas tank is Galloway push up on all the kickouts. So for once you'll have them out of position... It, 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 I don't know. It makes no sense some, some of the things some of these managers do. So Galway were terrible in the first half. Monaghan were terrible in the second half. And it was just a terrible, terrible game all around just to dampen the enthusiasm we had from Thursday night. Yeah, well, I, if I was um, if I was Monaghan manager, I would have challenged Rory Began and said, Rob Henley kicked the ball the length of the field against Ross Common. So I expect you to be able to do the same. Why would you hit the full forward line Did with the kick Did he kick out? it the length of the field? Yeah, it, got, it, got, it nearly went the full length of the field. Yeah, it, it, took, a, it took a bounce on heavy conditions. It was oh, just, I remember that. Yeah, 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 but look, you have to you have to play the conditions. If yeah, and the thing about it is, incessant hand passing and slow build up is oftentimes depending on the weather conditions is just like grossly ineffectual like it's just it a is. waste of time but it just shows the level they're married to these systems Keen. because like, like yeah. my argument is obviously we've discussed this before when going to it like if Carlo or, or play Dublin by all means you're going to get hammered so let's keep the game interesting these are all playing teams at their own level and they're still married to that system so it's not like they're using that system for a reason they just have only that system. They can't think outside the box. And even a wind, a gale force wind won't bring them out of this. Like, it's just so... Like yeah. I know you... I, well, look, I've it's said it's it, I, those systems are just dumb to begin with. They're the easiest systems you can ever coach. And it's clearly obvious a lot of these managers have no other idea outside of saying, everybody drop inside that 45. Even a wind won't make them change. Yeah, I know. Look, but it is, it's an interesting one because Kevin Walsh will turn around and say, well, look, we've won two of our first three games. And well, that's the problem. And then we have the Black Death for Mana winning against Kildare. So now they have four points. So, like, I mean, this is, they'll turn around and say this to you every time. But, yeah. like, I mean, ugh, I don't know. Well, it's not. It's not for the neutral, and we have to remember we're we're, we're neutrals most of the time. So, uh, it's you have to. Oftentimes, you just try and be balanced, and you say, "Well, why are they doing this, or why are they not doing it?" And like for example, the Monaghan one with with a with a huge win at their back, like Began playing short kickouts. I can understand how he would he would do that, keep possession, and move the ball up the field. That's the way Monaghan try to play a lot of the time. And but then you're meeting Galway yeah, back no, but, there. But I I would agree with you. I think that when you have a team sucked on and that's why I'm quite surprised because Monaghan have been really good at that sucking a team right onto them and then hitting it over the top to runners and and things like that yeah. now look maybe they just are oftentimes I think that Monaghan are, are play play sort of interest and stuff where they, they they play matches where they try certain things knowing that well we might use a bit of this later on down the line I think I just get that impression that they're, that they're trying to be quite clever with a lot of what they do but if that's not what they're up to and they're really trying to trying to win the game then I think it's a bit foolish because Began can put the opposition under an awful lot of pressure by landing the ball down there and the reality is all it takes is a, as you say, like a flick on from midfield. All of a sudden, you're in behind the opposition's half back line, yeah. which is the which is the opportunity that you're trying to create at all times at all with your times. attacking play. And it's the Achilles heel of these defensive systems because you know when these came in first, they'd actually concede the kick out and camp back there, so there was yeah. no way. Now the copycat nature of Jim McGuinness pushing up on Cluxton in 2014 you know they all copy yeah. they don't have original ideas themselves so now it's in fashion to push up and everything so there's their weakness Yeah, use that bloody weakness and especially if you have the wind and it's almost like you're talking to a brick wall with some of these bloody fellas anyways the oh yeah the Black Death won by one and are on four points Kildare scored one point from play in the whole game listen we're not arguing that this system is not, can't be effective like, it can be effective. But at the same time, for Manor are Division 2 team, Kildare are a very weakened Division 2 team. They've hardly any of the regulars. If for Manor went out and tried to beat Kildare, playing more attack and branded football, there's a very good chance they could beat Kildare by two points doing that either. So it's like, you wonder what's the point. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, Galway could have beaten Monaghan yesterday just going for that in the first half a bit more. It's almost like people say, well, we won doing that. 
But you're playing a team your level. You probably would have beaten them the other way too. Yeah. So why not just make it a good game to watch? And you might have won by a bit more and as And your well. forwards might have enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, London beat Wexford. Um, this was a huge result. They hammered Wexford actually. And we know Wexford are on the slide. Um, I was looking through the London team there's only six players that played against Loud in the qualifiers and like I mean Kieran it's Dealey it's a massive turnover unbelievable it, like I mean he it can't be underestimated the good job he does with them and like I mean whenever you hear him talking he's impressive and like he says all the right things and he's just increased the standards of football over there really well like for them to get a, a, a league result against Wexford is just fantastic stuff um, we'll try and get Kieran on the show Um uh, soon enough I tried to get him on it last year for whatever reason but our schedules kind of clashed so fair play to London especially with that turnover like I mean it's just I look, it's like playing football in America there's just a new crop of lads ever, out all the time you have your um, Gavigans and your Gotchas and you, you know the lads you'd, names you'd recognise they're the stalwarts that are there and there are more London based players now but based on that turnover they're, they're, they're the only fellas that stayed around could be London London fellas at that stage. But a question I wanted to ask you here, Keen, quickly was, so Donegal were 10 to 1-4 up in the lead. There was a really strong wind in that one as well. That was a huge shock. There's only two points between the first seven teams in Division 2. We said this was going to be a bloodbath. So, like, you're sitting pretty on top. Like, Mead could be in trouble for relegation even. Like, well, Cork will go down. They're terrible. But, like, I mean, the, the reality is you can't make any uh, predictions on this. But anyways, Donegal got 10 points with the wind. Uh, Roscommon got 10 points with the wind. Really strong wins that we know about. Carlo got five. Galway got four. Like, I'm just thinking, when you look at a really strong wind like that, I'm thinking you want to be hitting one nine. You want one nine on the board. Like, I mean, the, the reality yeah. is, and you want to be getting the other team down to four or five. Like, you need a six, seven point the, lead there. The big thing is, very often when you're playing these games, what you always want, when you're playing against a really strong wind like that, obviously you're thinking... If we can get a goal, we're sti- we're well in this. A game. goal is huge. A goal against the wind is massive. And when you have the wind, you're thinking we want to be six, eight, ten points clear here to be in a strong position. And ideally, if you can get a goal or two with, you know, if you can get a goal with the wind, you're you're really in a strong yeah. position. So you can you can you can end the game in a ten minute spell with the wind. See a lot of the, yeah, you can of, kill the game as kill a contest. The game completely. Yeah. You could yeah. get two two and on the top of maybe four one lead, and then suddenly it's two six to one point, and suddenly the game's over. But uh, there's an awful lot of different cultures within teams of ha- whether they use the wind or not. So in Port Leash, always, any team I was on, we took the wind advantage. We'd be favourites, there'd be a good chance. we say, let's put it out of their heads, let's bliss them out of it, give them no hope. Uh, you see other teams we'd play, like even smaller teams, and they know we like playing with the wind, and they'll go against it, give us what we want. Based on the fact, I'd a- ask them afterwards, well, we thought we'd have more energy and we'd, we might be able to hold out and... You know, all this kind of thing. And I, I couldn't believe we lost the toss and they gave us the win. The game was over at half time, And they've chosen that. So a lot of teams, actually, the culture within the club is to go against the wind. Do you know? And now, obviously, that can work to your advantage. Sometimes this is all hindsight analysis afterwards. Well, they got tired and we, you know, sometimes and the other argument is sometimes at the start of the game, it's hard to get your rhythm. So you actually might have 12, 30 minutes of with the wind wasted before you kind of gauge the wind and understand how strong it is. A lot of balls wasted. It's hard to know. I'm, I'm, I'm 100% uh, a with the wind man. Yeah, look at it. I mean, look, it's always hindsight is is uh, well, that's is twenty twenty with it. Oh, we you know we chose to play with the wind, and all of a sudden you're eight points no score up after ten minutes, and it's like great decision. You know, the flip side of it is that oh, we played, we we kept the wind for the second half, and we rallied from behind to to get a couple of long range scores and win it. I I just think that whatever advantage you can take, just take it when it's there. Yeah. I mean, there's there's no guarantee that the wind isn't going to die down. To, you, you know, so you just take it when it's available to you and try to maximise it. Like, it's called wind advantage. So take the advantage when it presents itself to you. Yeah, that's a message to Kevin Walsh and a message to Carlo as well, who didn't seem to take the advantage. Went in at, at half time, one down and one uh, at 11 all square. Leitrim quickly, quick mention. So Leitrim, she's just flying it. We had Terry Highland on the show last Thursday. They... Trailed by three points at half time, and they've got a hundred percent start of campaign. Only Kerry Mayo, Derry, Leitrim have a hundred percent records. The form table across all four divisions, Leitrim sit top of everything because they've the best scoring difference. Which is they ran up a good score against Wexford. It's absolutely incredible start for them, and really, I'm absolutely. 
delighted for them. And I hear that the 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 setup they have there with Terry Highland, like I mean, they're now using GPS trackers and they're using more scientific reports, which they never had before. And you always see a big kick with a county that comes in and suddenly a professional attitude. It changes the whole culture. And even if the GPS, right? Like, I mean, the way I look at the GPS, they're not going to improve your performance. You might try run a little bit harder when you're wearing them, but if usually with the smaller counties, there's only one or two. So it's not like you can stick stick them in all 50 and have lads jumping out of their skin. But it feeds into the whole thing. We're flying it this year. We're going well. Confidence. You know, the, the, the security and the confidence you have from knowing there's nothing we're not doing. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, no, it is. It's a big thing. It just, it, it's just, it keeps the mentality of the group moving in the right direction, particularly when you have a county like Leitrim who would have a huge turnover in players. Uh, any sort of encouragement you can give guys to, to stick at it or continue to, you know, oh, we're building something here, you know, to have that feeling that, look, we're going in the right yeah. direction. And I that's, think that's, that's very important. That's sports psychology. And you it's usually important. Like, I mean, you can get a sports psychologist in and you can, it's a, 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 in my experience, a lot of it was nonsense. But there's no better sports psychology for me than to feel clear in my head that I'm flying fit and that we know the opposition well and we're covered. My God, the confidence you have yeah. when you have that feeling, it's a brilliant, brilliant feeling. And I'd imagine that's what the dubs go into every game with because they know they have every box ticked and they're flying it. And that, I don't think it can be underestimated how, how important all that stuff is. But anyways, um, we'll be back uh, next and we'll talk about Kerry Dublin. Okay. We'll continue on here. We'll, I'll let you go to attend to then, King. Yeah, we'll do perfect, 20 minutes yeah. here. All right, good to go in there, lads. <coughs> yep. Okay. So Kerry 118, Dublin 214. Like, I mean, this, like I said at the start of the show, this was an absolutely cracking game. It was two teams, and I think Kieran Whelan did, like, good analysis, obvious enough analysis, but, like, I mean, they both got bodies back, which we know they do, but they're both matching up on people. Like, I mean, they have a man, you know, in their sights. They're not dropping back into zones. So, like, I mean, when both teams move the ball fast through the foot, which is the best form of attack for me because it beats any retreating player. There's one-on-ones on both ends of the field. So you've got that excitement and they both got the ball in there. Not only were there one-on-ones, they used those one-on-ones really, really well. Kerry mixed up their game plan brilliantly. We talked loads of times about why don't teams test out Dublin's full back line. We talked about it's a waste of time if you test that out when you give them a sweeper to double around. Kerry ticked all those boxes that they matched up man for man. So when they gave in the long ball, it did cause an awful lot of panic for Dublin. Like, I mean, Kerry got their game plan right. And again, we're not saying Kerry are back based on this game, but it would be encouraging from a tactical point of view what Peter Kane um, brought. And maybe it's Donny Buckley because Donny Buckley matched up when he was with Mayo with Dublin all over the field and had one-on-ones inside. It was it was almost similar to a Mayo-Dublin type game. Yeah, well, I think, look, what Kerry are doing... With particularly when you have a guy like Dara Minan, who I'm f- fairly sure he played centre back on the Kerry Miners, so he really? ha- he has he has quite decent defensive instincts. If uh, I might be even say I'm open to correction on that one, but either way, Ke- Kerry used our players well in terms of they they press the ball where they can and they all kind of drop back a line. So their full forward line were working out a lot of the time. Stephen O'Brien was buzzing around all over the place. Gavin O'Brien was out wing forward. You know, they, they just had a number of players working really, really hard in that middle third of the field. But you're right, they, they didn't really, more often than not, they were onto a man. They were, they were tagged with a Dublin player, putting their direct opponent under a bit of pressure where they yeah. could, keep, keeping them on the, keeping the, their own defensive side of the Dublin player, not letting them in behind. And, by slowing the game down, by by putting in that sort of work rate higher up up the field and pressing the ball and putting Dublin under pressure, slowed down the Dublin attack. And Dublin at times are their own worst enemy because they're moving the ball too slow. They're kind of sometimes they're a bit over over indulgent with their possession play. Um, it was allowing Kerry get back, and Tyg Morley was kind of dropping in and trying to double up then when it went over his head into the full forward line. But when Dublin moved the ball really fast they were able to open open things up. Like Mannion's goal is a good example. Now, we said we'd be a bit critical of the defending. I think really the, the Kerry corner back in that situation, he... he lo- it was Brian O'Beagley. Yeah, he, yeah. Lo- he lost the flight of the ball and he just got caught then wrong side. Well, it, what, what he did wrong side was that he... Did he half think Mannion's going to come in on his left? And he kind of stepped that way and it's like, Jesus, that's not good defending. Mannion yeah, no. has to... You have to stay goal side of Mannion at all times yeah, like, and then you have to stand him up. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, the thing about it is, it's it's a principle of good defending is that you you don't get caught the wrong side, so you don't end up if if you can't win the ball, you yeah. can't compete which for the ball. Which he couldn't. Which he could not win that ball because it was a good pass in. It was kind of on an angle. He needed to immediately step off Mannion and get goal side, yeah. so that when Mannion turned, he had Obiugli straight in front of him in front of the goals. Yeah. Whereas what happened was he ended up sort of chasing around with Mannion because he was trying to get to the ball, and he ended up caught wrong side. Yeah. And with the pace and the power that Mannion had, he wasn't going to. All he could do was foul him um, and Mannion in fairness to him did really well he stepped across him and finished it brilliantly but from 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 the defensive perspective you would say it was it was just he got it wrong I said on Thursday Bugley is a very good all action yeah, player he's, a, he's an all or nothing I like him player, but he yeah. doesn't have that defensive instincts like for, for example Harrison from Mayo would not make that mistake and what's Harrison would track that run and he would know Mannion there's a good chance he's going to take him on that outside and he would meet him and Mannion would feel that kind of strength and Mannion would back off him and maybe recycle he, ma- the amount of times you see Dublin half take on a Mayo defender and turn back and go I'm not going to chance this this, yeah. is, this is not happening with Kerry they don't have the respect for them they go at them and they, they get so much joy out of it Like yep. there, was, there wasn't even a goal on when Con got it that was poor defending too so that was, issue was still a, there that was, yeah, it was, look it was poor defending but it was exceptionally good play from Con yeah. Callan. Like the, he has such a powerful step that when he when he plants and he changes direction he's moving away from defenders all the time like it was an it was an unbelievably good piece of individual brilliance from Con O'Callaghan I couldn't yeah. speak highly enough of it because there's so m- he's one of the few players that can do that like there's there are very few players that can do that or, yeah. or in any generation that were able to do that like what what he can do there and to be able to see it on a semi-regular basis from him is just yeah. it was even though class. it was going wide I think if it hadn't ah, got the deflection it. if you like don't you shoot you can't score what you're in the sake? forwards union yeah. there absolutely uh, after beating four men and yeah. like when he picked up that ball there was absolutely nothing on no most like 99% of players uh, get that ball under pressure recycle it back outside the 45 so like when he picked up the ball there was nothing on he yeah. made he made that goal out of absolutely nothing it was just pure class the thing about just to go back to this man on man defending and like I mean the great thing about this and what I really like about it is unlike the Galway Monaghan thing where a lot of players now will try and take maybe take on the man the minute they feel hands on them they're not going to be stupid they're just throwing it back out they're moving it across they're trying trying to go in somewhere else and moving across with the man on man the minute you get hands on someone, he's no options. So he's looking in, there's no... The only option is maybe to kick it in. Then you've got lads straight out, you're turning... You get a lot more turnovers given the kick option. I've said this so many times. You absolutely you, do, You're yeah. actually winning those balls if you've pressure on the field, out the field. But the thing about it is, you're under pressure, there's hands on, but there's a lot of bodies around there, but you all have a man. So you see your teammate getting hands on, right? You can leave your man and double him up, you have him swarmed. He's no out ball. Yeah. Do you know, so there's so many advantages of doing this. Number one, there's a lot more turn. You turn it over a lot quicker. The game isn't an eyesore. You're giving him the option of the kick passing, which also gives you a, a chance if you're if, if there's pressure on the kick. And it just seems like such a, a much more aggressive, um, do you know, game plan. And you can still get those turnovers. But like, it's hard to get turnovers the way if you camp inside the 45 because the minute they feel contact they'll just throw it back out and Dublin have become masters at that but Dublin had no ball to throw back out the other night they, if they were getting hands on the minute Kerry lad saw right well he's got enough hands on here now that I can leave my man and get over and double up on him yeah. and that seems like such a, a much more uh, obvious thing to do yeah well I think look there, there's a happy medium to be found between going the all out zone men behind the ball and you know, leaving it man for man. I mean, I mean, I think every every team has sort of learned that that you yeah, know you have to it, maybe drop you have to drop a couple of sorry lines. Sorry to cut you off, but it's it's not man for man in the old sense of man for man, where everything's open. You're man for man. No, st- it's still a crowded space. It's still like you know you're no, still look, playing the defensive. You're is playing it, defensively. It's not man for man, and that you leave six forwards up the field at all times. Yeah. And now, in fairness, that never really happened. No. Most teams their half forward line dropped. There's certainly two of a half forward line drop. Midfielders drop. And like I mean, it's an absolute myth that it was always six forwards and the two midfielders stood around the middle and didn't, you know. Like, Pat I mean, Spillan, uh for years would have gone back. Michael Donnellan would have gone back and intercepted yeah, a lot of passes. Bra- now, he wouldn't be well, doubling up, but he'd be intercepting a lot of passes. Yeah, so exactly. that was going I mean, on a lot I mean, the, the working wing forward and midfielders and guys that cover ground have always been in the game. I think what's happened, unfortunately, in recent times is that Look, fortunately for Donegal, they got great success out of the great ambush. And there's the legacy of that is that we've been left with all of the copycat stuff. Yeah. 
but it, look, we're blue in the face talking about it. There's more than one way to play. I actually, I'm happy enough to see Kevin Walsh play the way he plays with Galway and stick to it and play the way he plays. I'm, I'm happy enough to see Carlo play the way they play. I just, I would be against the fact that everyone should be trying to play that way. And I don't think they are. Like the games that I've been watching, Mead don't play that way. Armagh don't play that way. Dublin don't play that way. Mayo, Kerry. These teams are, they're, they're adapting to different situations. But I think that the game is slowly moving back towards a more positive approach. I think it is too. And games like that on a Saturday night while all the copycat managers look on, is no harm at all. Do you know what I mean? It's absolutely no harm. Fenton wasn't as dominant. Jack Barry really has his number and it wasn't the only game I saw Jack Barry completely tag Fenton. And the, the, uh, how demoralising for a midfielder to be man-marked like that everywhere. Like, I mean, that's yeah. not well, easy. See, it's like, horrible because midfielders usually go, you take me on, I'll take... Like, David Moran would not follow him to the same well, degree. He'd say, I'll outfetch you, I'll outplay you. And it's always a good battle between them two. But, like, Jack Barry's just, like, given up his given up his game nearly to well to Jack t- Barry every time Kerry and Dublin play he's 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 on Fenton they, they they were both in UCD together Fenton's obviously incredible athlete but Jack Barry's a serious athlete as well. he's a he, huge man Jack Barry he's very powerful but I mean this guy is was winning all this endurance tests and everything underage with Kerry at his own age like I mean he's a serious athlete so he's well fit to run with Fenton which is what a lot of midfielders struggle with is staying with oh Fenton. yeah absolutely I mean to, to stay a full 70 minutes running after Fenton because <laughs> Fe, Fenton has that he he has that step as well where he can just explosively move away from players and look I think Jack Barry every time he's marked him has done a very good job on him now it's it remains to be seen whether Jack Barry can add further to that but he doesn't really need to if he can keep Fenton constantly putting Fenton under pressure and not letting Fenton get through too often that's fine but sometimes what happens is Jack Barry is given a job of marking Fenton but then there's overlaps coming and he's drifting across and then all of a sudden Fenton gets it and he's not able to get back across so yeah. look he, he limited his influence but still Fenton was still impressive at times I mean he's just so positive uh, early on in the game look, nothing was really happening for Dublin they were they were fairly poor and they, they lacked creativity like I mean the only real creative force Fenton is creative he looks to kick Scully looks to kick Howard was way too deep. He wasn't offering anything from yeah. an attacking perspective. I mean, he's he's miles away from what he was doing for them last year in terms of his level of performance. And Thomas Sullivan did very well on Scully too. Scully started getting on a few balls, but he oh, yeah, went Thomas, out Thomas of Sullivan was definitely a yeah. match for him when it was man to man combat, when it was marking, when it was pace, and when he had to, when he was physically up against him. Scully was no way was he going to go by him. Right? Yeah. He has his number that way, but Scully was able to just drift and when he did get the ball in hand and he did have the ability to deliver it in he made telling contributions like the, the, just the quality in his foot passing is just really really good but to me I know skipping around a bit here but to me the biggest thing for Dublin is Comerford and goals is he's nowhere near good enough to be a Dublin goalkeeper I mean he cost Dublin that game the other night really despite all the good work and despite all of Kerry's good play he was he was the disaster in the goals really that cost him the game. Yeah, was that but well was that one point which you'd never one really short kick out, but all of his kickouts are just they're 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 just to me they're just childish kickouts. I mean he's just rolling the ball five yards. There's no no variety to what he can do. He can't he doesn't seem to be able to kick the ball long to midfield at all. So I mean he's like when you compare him to what he's up against and when you compare him against the goalkeepers of a lot of the other top teams, he's below that level. Maybe, yeah, and where Dublin are always used to having one below although Cluxton in fairness does tap him just to the corner back an awful lot as well. Like but I mean they, just, try, they but just tried to get it restarted rather yeah, than no, the but kick the, out. But the other night with Kerry pressing them and with the way the weather conditions were, you had to play that a little bit more. Yeah. Like you had to see like he had to be able to see that and make it a decision. Why would you not kick the ball to Brian Fenton? Oh well, that's yeah. It doesn't like, make it sense. doesn't make any sense. And it's all you have like to do is hang one up there. Fenton will win it, yeah. and then you have runners off, and you're fifty meters further up the pitch, yeah. and you're after taking six or eight carry players out of the but game. But they're completely, and we've talked about this loads of times. There, that Fenton could be seventy thirty, but the tap to Johnny Cooper is a hundred percent, and they take it. They take that hundred percent over. It's a percentage game with them because, like, I mean, sure, we know Cluxton's array of kickouts are sensational, but he he's toned down his kickout. You know, no, he does he too. does more often than not. But when the occasion calls for it, he makes that decision to yeah. go long. Yeah. And I think that Comerford doesn't have that range. Now, maybe he will develop it. Maybe he's just to be fair to give him a bit of leeway. Maybe he's just feeling his way in. He's thinking, I'm not taking that chance. But really, I mean, what chance is it? You're kicking the ball out to the best midfielder in the country and you have serious, <laughs> powerful players around him. Like, just kick the bloody ball out and move the ball up the field. Like, yeah. it doesn't make... He was putting his defenders under ridiculously unnecessary pressure by playing it to the corners. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. But there's obviously that huge irony uh, with that in that the other team goes out of their way to avoid Fenton. 
but Dublin don't give it to Fenton. So, like, I mean, <laughs> exactly. giving it to Fenton is what the other team don't want, and you don't do it. So that yeah. makes no sense either. Like, he, th- I think uh, Fenton is the dominant fetcher in the whole country by by far. Really, I don't think there's too many that can put it up to him in the air. David Moore and maybe. Um, there's probably one or two more that aren't jumping jumping through but the long balls into the full back line they were really good like they were good bloody long balls Gini's well able for them Tommy Walsh actually came on in the second half and they didn't give him too many long ones at all they gave way more in the first half maybe the wind had had, had some bearing on that but Walsh won a couple of good marks he looked very lively um, Johnny Cooper got the hump because he was taken off because James McCarthy was put back and like I mean James McCarthy's just an absolute uh, machine of a man to be able to score three points, then go back troubleshoot on 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 Tommy Walsh, and the one high ball that was given into Tommy Walsh, James McCarthy broke yeah. it away. Like I mean, he's just an all round. I tell you one thing, Dublin though, legend. It's, it's not a bad tactic if you just think right. I'll bring on a big lad, stick him in full forward. We'll that'll take James take McCarthy James back to the full back and line. That's the gas thing is you still have Gini in there, so yeah. you could almost say to Walsh, go that side, and we can still isolate Cooper on Gini. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So to- I think Tommy Walsh is a huge plus. Because he was lively the other night, like he oh, actually he, looked he, like he did, wasn't out of place. No, there he did. All. No, he, his movement was quite sharp, and he was he was showing well. He 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 took a good mark, and unfortunately kicked it wide. But and I thought at Ke- the same time he was lively. Yeah. Were you listening to it on RTE or on air? Uh, RTE. Yeah, because how Kevin McStay was very harsh on Tommy Walsh. He, Tommy Walsh has very good control over a football for a big man. It was almost like, well, that Kevin was uh, or Kevin McStay said, well, that's the the downside of a big man that there might not be as good with the kick. And I thought like. Tommy Walsh can kick off left and right with great control, no? He can, yeah. Well, I suppose, look, early on in his career, he was sent, he was absolutely brilliant uh, ball winner and he was a good finisher as well. Look, maybe he's just, he plays out the field more with his club. He's probably not as, uh, probably hasn't just got the same amount of work done in terms of his finishing. But if he if he's going to be an option in the full forward line for Kerry, which I think he, he should be, he sh- has the potential to be quite a good option for him, that'll sharpen up over the course of the year if he's getting that practice done. Yeah. I wouldn't be too concerned because he has the ability. So, like, I mean, all the excuses, oh, Dublin were missing lads and Kerry were missing lads, and when you actually break it down, Dublin weren't missing very many the other night now. Like, I mean, they were missing Keno Sullivan, Kieran Kilkenny. Realistically, is that the, are they the ones after the guaranteed? Teach Philly McMahon as well. Is Philly even guaranteed Cluxton. this year? Oh, well, sorry, sorry. Of course, Cluxton, Kilkenny, and Keane. Um, now they're three huge ones, obviously. Look, to my mind, it's a. They ver- weren't under strength, but they're under. No, Jim no, Gavin th- says that they're not fully fit, and I would take that. Like I mean, to, to me, like there there are games sometimes in the course of your season or for the development of a team that you kind of have to win. Like Kerry had to win that game kind the other of, yeah. night to me, whereas Dublin didn't really. I, I don't think it'll ma- make any blind bit of difference to Dublin. If anything, it'll help them because it'll sharpen them up. It'll, Jim Gavin had the opportunity then to take off a couple of his main men, maybe yeah. just to leave them a bit pissed off. Like he took off Dean Rock, Johnny Cooper, were both doing grand. I You know, I didn't see, I don't know what the substitute, you know, why you would take them off. Maybe just they they both played nearly all of the first three games, three weeks in a row. They're not back training that long. Get other guys in. I think he's trying to piss them off. Like, I mean, this is the beauty of Jim Gavin in every year. Like Paddy Andrews now is back in getting games. Last year he was just completely ignored. He's mad for it now, even though like Paddy might be past his, getting towards past his best. But against Monaghan, like it was amazed Dean Rock was taken off. I thought he was actually playing well. I think he's trying to piss Dean Rock off. I think he's trying to make him worried about uh, Costello. I think he's trying to piss Johnny Cooper off. He's making him worry about... This is a psychological yeah, well, thing with Jim Gavin. I'm sure well, of it. I'm I, absolutely sure. And loads of managers fall into the trap of not doing that. Yeah, well, I, I thought that he took. I thought that he made those substitutions against Monaghan to take off those the key leaders that always come up trumps from and leave some of the younger players on and see. Well, how are you going to do when the game is in a melting pot? And he didn't. He didn't do that the other day against Kerry because he's bringing on McManaman and McCauley and these guys. But you know, it's maybe a good thing for Costello that Costello had to take that pressure free yeah. rather than Dean Rock who Dublin can always rely on. Like if anything happened to Dean Rock, you know, there'd be question marks there. Whereas now Costello, look, he's done it over the years underage but it's not the same thing and he's done no. it now in a pressure situation taking yeah. it free. So it's, it's, a, it's a good thing for the development of the group. It absolutely is. But now Dean Rock's saying, maybe before that, well, geez, if I'm not playing well, I'll, they I'll, leave, I'll, me, I'll on, leave yeah. me on for the freeze at least. Yeah. Now he know, like he knows that maybe he sees Costello in training, but never you'd never see Costello having to kick that in a match. It'd be always Dean Rock. That's all psychologically. Dean Rock cannot switch off now. Where and that's even can he can't be late for training. He can't. It just keeps those standards of Dean Rock honest. And like I mean, I know he's lucky in regards that he got so many fellas he can do this with. Like Brian Cody years ago with Kilkenny, he did something similar. Even JJ Delaney wouldn't feel comfort, wouldn't feel safe about his position. 
but that's that Brian Cody is ruthless there's too many managers best friends with their players and like Jews will I don't want Dean Rock to ignore me now for the next week do you know like I mean you have to be very strong you have to be very standoffish and maybe you have to have the personality like Cody and Jim Gavin that you're my players you respect me but like we're not like we can be f- colleagues and friends but like don't think I'm going to feel bad for dropping you but yeah I mean I know managers who might feel awkward for dropping a player yeah there it is look it's um, it's an interesting one with Gavin and he, he he over the years has managed his squad very well in, in a very ruthless way so it should come as no surprise to us and it I certainly would not be surprised if that's the agenda that he has going on there too to just throw different guys in test them see what they're like because the league is not the be all and end all for Dublin now. Look, five in a row is the is the big big thing. And look, yeah. the reality is Dublin are still in a reasonable position for the for the re- remainder of the league campaign. They, they'll want to pick up wins, but they've played they played the teams that are up near the top. They still have to and play Mayo. Cavan and Ross Mayo, and Mayo. Next. Mayo. Yeah, uh, if they lose to Mayo, they won't make the final, which is a still a big thing for Dublin. No, it is a big thing for them, but they are quite undercooked. I would say I would expect that they play Mayo in two weeks' time. I would expect Dublin to come out all guns blazing. And the thing about yeah. it is because they'll. It's, to a certain extent as well they'd want to put Mayo back in their box and Mayo have had a nice little run in here where they've played all of the teams that are going quite badly in the league they, they haven't played Monaghan they haven't played Ke- Kerry they haven't played Dublin, uh, yeah. Dublin and they haven't played Galway so like they Mayo have all that hard games to come so Mayo could lose all four of them and you'd be thinking God Mayo are going nowhere so yeah. Look, I, I there's a that, lot. There's a yeah. huge amount still to play for, but it's all very interesting at the minute. I, I would think. Say. Th- I think the Dublin. Just to finish up, I think the Dublin uh, message in their training session, lads. We're still getting back fit. We're still getting back fit. Two week break now. Mayo. No more excuses now. We're heading into. These are four games left for championship, and I. There'll be no more Jim Gavin mentioned fitness or anything like that now. It's, this is just more no, serious yeah, no, stuff. Absolutely, I would say it'll it'll flick the switch with Dublin, and look, it, it's it just sets it up for the Mayo Dublin game in a couple of weeks time to be actually a really really big game for both teams yeah it'll be fantastic right um, I'm going to let you go I'm going to do performance of the weekend on my own alright so Paddy Power performance of the weekend I hope there's people still tuned in after me announcing Keane is leaving the studio and I'm doing it on my own but anyways we're going to run through a few nominations um, here and we'll finish up then so Connor Cox is the first one so he was outstanding yesterday. He got three from play in the first half. He set up the goal uh, for Ulton Harney and it was an outstanding bit of skill to set up the goal. Like He was twisting and turning all over the place. There was nothing else on. Two Tyrone fellas um, chasing him and he still had the composure. I'd say he was going for a point. I wouldn't say he was squaring it for Ulton Harney but it was still so a really good skill. Really good instinctive corner forward. He's your classic corner forward. Small, got both feet, got a huge kick on him. Um, and, a, and a low centre of gravity but he's well able to handle himself on the field so I'm very enthusiastic about Connor Cox very very good yesterday um, himself and Dermot Murta will cause all sorts of problems maybe with uh, Donny um, Smith uh, giving, in, giving him in a few balls maybe playing in f- out in front of the two of them so like I mean and you have to say about Roscommon as well while we've been negative about uh, Donny Smith and a couple of the eye gout they're mixing up a nice kicking game I know they had a, a strong win but at least they showed that flexibility and weren't backing into their own 45 they actually moved the ball very well through the foot they got their 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 kind of really good spell maybe 15 minutes before before half time but like they're mixing it up well there's more to Ross Common than just mindless getting bodies back behind the ball, which is which is really good to see. And he has shored up to their defence. So, like, I mean, Anthony Cunningham der- deserves an awful lot of credit for the job he's been doing with them so far. Uh, David Tuberty, he's on it again. I think David Tuberty's been on it on a performance of the weekend every weekend since we've started the league. If he hasn't, he should have been because he got 1-7 one ar- one against Cork who you know are going through an awful time he's still only 32 uh, feels like he's been around an awful lot longer than that he got 1-7 against Armagh as well and that was the winning or the 1-1 the one, one that drew it and he got 6 points against Donegal 3 of them were from play so David Tobert is in sensational form absolutely brilliant brilliant form for Division 2 so it's not like he's whacking them in uh, against 3 and 4 opposition Jamie Malone won't thank him too much for his goal um, Jamie Malone's uh, shot looked like it was absolutely going in um, David <laughs> David totally robbed the goal off him so that's between Jamie and David I don't want to get involved in that so David uh, 1-7 again he's definitely in the mix Evan O'Carroll who's featured here before got 8 points 2 from freeze 1 mark and 5 from play Evan's flying it he's with UCD and the Sigerson. you definitely know 
the Sigerson fellas always perform well in the early rounds of the league and like I mean it's no it's not rocket science in that they're at championship fitness levels they have to be for the Sigerson and then they're coming back playing against fellas who might be at third game league first game second game league kind of fitness levels so like they always stand out but it's brilliant news for Leash John Sugru made huge amount of changes from the team that were hammered in well beaten w- fairly well by Loud in Croke Park eight changes no outfield line um, survived so they end up with uh, five Port Leash fellas on it who I think not trying to be biased there should always be five Port Leash lads on it Paul Cahillan got in um, Colin Boyle was on it Graham Brody was on it David Seal was on it and their oh Garrett Dillon was on it so like I mean Port Leash win the county title in Leash every single year and there should be a good representation of Port Leash lads who are used to winning on that team. I don't think there should be any excuse other than that. But John Sugru doesn't hold back after that bad result. So eight in total, that was a good result uh, for Leash. They needed to win it. They would have been expected to beat um, Sligo. So, like, I mean, Evan O'Carroll is in the mix. Gavin O'Brien, I thought, was excellent the other night. Has a li- a definitely a little bit of bite in him. We talked about that um, game already. That brilliant uh, fetch he got for I think it was for a Paul Gini point but like I mean to come on in an uh, inexperienced player and to be marking James McCarthy and to give James all he wanted of it even though I have James McCarthy down here as well who scored three from play and went in troubleshooting on Tommy Walsh so don't think there's too much more we can say about James McCarthy he's just an absolute Dublin legend and never lets Dublin down and can you know just fix problems for them all over the field Darren Moynihan he was excellent as well Great bit of bite to him too and he looks a very balanced player. Small stocky as well. Fionn McDonough, now I didn't see this game but I just want to comment quickly on Fionn McDonough and the point that he scored because we did a little bit of analysis on wing forward play, a position I'm very, very interested in because I played it myself and his point was carbon copy of what we were describing, lurking out around the wing and it's all about the angle of the run. You're waiting, you're waiting and then you're kind of, it's just almost like rugby talk. You talk about lines of running and you need to be able to see those lines that are becoming available and you need to be able to marry that line of running with how you're going to get a pass. And it's usually a hand pass, pop pass, and then you can split in the field and you can come in on your favourite boot and put it over the bar. He was excellent. Um, he is excellent. At that. It looks like a, definitely a skill that he has. And that was only one point he got, but that was really, really good. Um, finally, I have Colin P. Smith down here so he scored two points from wing back and he set up the goal with a long ball which I um, always like to hear um, so Longford are flying it they've won they've won two and drawn one now they beat um, three teams they definitely would have been expecting to beat so they beat Loud they beat Carlo and they drew it awfully at home so it's not like they're tearing it up against the really good teams in Division 3 yet. Now, we know they're missing a lot of players. They're missing Robbie Smith's not there. Porrick and Sean McCormack aren't there. The Mullinachta lads aren't there. And they Mullinachta lads will be like their fullback, Patrick Fox, the McGivneys, uh, Rian Brady, like these different fellas. So they're missing an awful lot of players. But nobody should be surprised that Longford are sitting on top of Division 3. They've been a really solid Division 3 team for a few years now. Um, maybe the surprise is there based on the fact that they've mi- missing a lot of lads, but these things can change very quickly because obviously they've got much more difficult challenges ahead than the ones that have already played. But Porrick Davis, we're going to try and get him on the show. He seems to be doing a very good job with them. He was with the he was more of my kind of year of playing. He played from ninety five to oh seven. The guy played ninety eight to eleven. Well, then it was a good few years missing in between that. But anyways, would have been a lot, lot of crossover between... Um, I would have played against teams he was on. Really class corner forward. Um, took over managing Mole Hill. Or Mo Hill. That's in Leitrim. And he won two senior championships, 221 and three consecutive leagues. He was with the Longford under 21s who got to the Leinster final. He was in with Glenn Ryan as a selector. So he served his dues and now he's doing really well with Longford. So there's loads of options that I have for interviews for the thir- Thursday show. Um, next week is going to be a club weekend, but sure, we'll get through, we'll get to them all um, as the league goes on. So, winner of performance of the weekend, I'm going to go with David Tuberty, 1-7. Um, and in fairness, that's 1-7 for two weeks in a row. And again, to add to the six against Donegal, he's definitely due a performance of the weekend. He's been around a long time, but he's got pure class in both feet 
and it's good to see him performing at the highest level in Division 2. So there you go. Did performance, Paddy Power performance at the weekend, all on my own, and um, that's it. David Tuberty, congratulations. We'll get the Paddy Power lucky pants out to you as soon as possible. Right, that's all we've time for. We'll be back on Thursday, and we'll look ahead to the club. I'll earn semi-finals. Talk to you then. Good luck. <laughs>